Well, good morning again and welcome to Crosswind Community Church and to this uh, conclusion of this sermon series that, uh, you know, so fittingly went with that song. Uh, I, I don't remember which came first, the series or the song, but, you know, riding the storm out. But, um, you know, the, for the past five weeks, we have been learning from and, and some of us have been reading through and reading about the life of this righteous man named Job. And by the way, I learned something the other day. Uh, uh, Karen and I had dinner with some friends of ours, and, and our friend Dale pointed something out to me that I never noticed in the book of Job. I completely missed this. Do you know who the shortest man in the Bible is? You'd think Zacchaeus, right? But no, it's actually Bildad the shoe height. Oh, Job chapter 2, verse 11. Bildad the shoe height. So, all right, well, bad jokes aside, and by the way, that is on the video and going to be on the internet forever now. But, uh, so, what we've learned from Job's story in the Bible is, is how God allowed Job to, to be tested. He allowed his ten children to be killed and, and all of his possessions to be destroyed or stolen and his health to be devastated with these painful sores from head to toe. And, and all throughout Job's suffering, all throughout this, these storms in his life, Job continued to seek answers. For 37 chapters, he had dialogue between his friends and, and he kept asking why, why. And, and finally, after those 37 chapters, God spoke. God confronted Job. And, and, and look at these words that God said to Job. Uh, this comes from chapter 38, verse 2. By the way, folks, I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit today. And so this would be a great day if you like to take notes to write them on the back of your bulletin. And, and you can kind of pop back to some of these scriptures maybe later in the day. But, but God says to Job, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? God gets right to the point, doesn't he? Job has been griping and complaining and talking with his friends, and God gets right to the point. But while I love the New Living Translation, I love how the message paraphrase puts it. God says to Job, why do you confuse the issue? Why do you talk without knowing what you're talking about? Pull yourself together, Job. I love that. I love those words. With this one verse, God not only points out to Job, but actually to each one of us, the limitations of our human ability to understand and our silliness for trying to grasp in our human, you know, wisdom who and what God is and what, or who God is and what God is capable of. But then, in the words that follow this, God doesn't apologize to Job or really offer any explanation for why. Why do good people suffer? God doesn't really justify his actions to Job. Instead, God comes back after all of 37 chapters of questions and, and complaints from Job, and he offers out more than 70 questions that one after the other reveal to us and to Job God's sovereign rule and God's loving care for his creation and God's complete justice. Simply put, God says to Job, all of Job's questions of why, 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 God's answer is God. God's answer to our struggle. God is the answer to our struggles in this world. That's basically what, how God responded to Job. Job, you want to know why all these things are happening. You want to know this. You want to know that. God. Now, God's not saying, I caused all of this stuff. But God is saying, I know what's going on. I am in control of all of creation. And so... 
Folks, when we are in the, in the riding out the storms, God is the answer. Everything else that we attempt to do to answer why we're in the midst of the storm or to help us get out of that storm, anything else is the wrong answer. God is the only answer when we have been hit by one of life's storms. Now, since that kind of brings me to the whole point of today's message, that was a pretty short message, wasn't it? Some of you are getting excited, but I thought that maybe because we've covered so much ground in this message series, and, and, and if you've been reading, there's a lot that I didn't even touch on. And so I thought this morning that I would quickly go back and review some of the lessons that we've learned as we've gone through the book of Job. So again, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Uh, you can write these down on the back of your bulletin, or you can go back. This video will be online. You can check it out online later. But uh, number one, bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to good people. The book of Job opens by telling us that Job was this blameless man of complete integrity who feared God and who stayed away from evil. And then we read how one thing after another, his life just kind of unravels right around him. But what we find out is Job's suffering didn't happen because he was a bad guy. Job's suffering didn't happen because he had done something wrong. It happened in spite of his unwavering faithfulness in God. And, and that's hard for us to fathom. Right? Because if we follow God and we trust God and we believe in Jesus, in our human wisdom, life should be good. And so the lesson that we learn from this is as followers of Jesus, there's not only going to be times of joy and, and wonderment and excitement, but there are going to be times of suffering as well. Number two, in times of suffering, we must never lose our hope in God. One of the great statements of faith found in the Bible is actually found right in the middle of chapter 13 of the book of Job. It's, it's found in verse 15. And there Job says, I think I put it up here, Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. That's an incredibly profound statement of faith. Though he slay me, yet I will hope. In him we just sang that song always right and and I had written these words weeks ago no one or no thing can steal our joy or our peace when our hope is in God and so the lesson learned from this is in the midst of storms we need to keep our hope in God we need to keep our eyes on God we need to reassure ourselves with our trust in God. Number three, our friends may fail us in the storms, but God never does. Some of you maybe have experienced this in your life. Job did. Job's friends came to him, but they gave him really kind of poor advice. They tried to explain how God worked. They had God put in their little bitty box, and they tried to explain to, to Job how God worked. But they didn't really understand God. They didn't have a true understanding of God. And, and so rather than offering him comfort in his time of need, they really put Job on the defense. And, and you may remember these words from a few weeks ago in Job chapter 16, verse 2. Job says to, you, to his friends, you are miserable comforters, all of you. Man, can you imagine being so fed up with your friends of saying that? And so the lesson learned is quite often our friends mean well. The people that, that love and care for us, they mean well. But sometimes they, they have a tendency to tell us what they think we want to hear or they have a tendency to tell us what they think they want to tell us instead of the truth that we really need. Lesson number four is even in what seems like God's silence, God is present with us in our storms. You know, this was the thing that Job wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with. He just felt that 
God was silent for so long when he kept praying and asking why and, and he felt like God was so far away from him and he couldn't hear from God and he couldn't see God and the storm had just enveloped him in the midst of his suffering. He just thought God was gone. And that's why over and over and over again, Job kept asking why questions. Why, why, why? He was continually asking God to make his presence known. And he wanted God, most importantly, to make his presence known so that he could present his case, so that he could defend himself. And eventually, though, once God spoke again, once Job heard God, he, he began to understand that God hadn't gone anywhere, that God wasn't actually silent, that, that God was there all along. And so the lesson for us in this is to remember that even when it seems like God is silent, even when it seems like in the midst of those struggles and those trials, we are not alone. We are never alone. God never leaves us nor never forsakes us or forgets us. I, I put these words up here from Isaiah 41. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. Notice that. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. There's no may in there. There's no if I choose to. It's I will. I will. Number five, wisdom comes from faith in God and turning away from evil. This is, has a lot to do with pride. Humans are a prideful bunch. We are a prideful bunch. And, and pride can interfere with us following the ways, if you will, that God puts before us. I don't want to say following the plan, but following the path. Following where God would like us to go. And, and sometimes in the midst of storms, we saw this with Job. And, and some of us have experienced in our own life, our, our own pride, our own idea, I can do this myself, gets in the way. And... And if you will, it clouds our ability to see. And before we know it, we come out of that storm, we're not following God. We're following evil. We're following something else. Job explained it a little bit like this in Job 28, verse 28. And he said, Job is, is talking about God. And he said to the human race, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. And understand that word fear is not cowering in the corner trembling. It's respect. It's honor. It's trust. The trust of the Lord, that's wisdom. And so the lesson learned is God is not only the God of the mountaintop and the joys and, and the good times, but God's is our answer to everything, even the storms of life. Lesson number six, we learned that God is in control. We talked about that. We saw in Job chapter one and chapter two that how everything, that's where Job's life began to unravel. You may remember that things, you know, his kids died and all of that stuff that happened. But what we need to remember is the conversation that God and Satan had going on. And what I want you to remember is that nothing came into Job's life that didn't first go through the hands of God, that didn't first pass by God. Satan didn't do anything to Job that God didn't first know about. And you may remember, go back and look if you don't. God put restraints on Satan. You can take all this stuff, but you can't touch his life. You can't take his life. You can cover him with boils, but you can't take his life. You see, God was in control, even in the midst of that storm, caring for Job. We need to remember, just like Job did, that God is the creator of everything. And God is almighty and all-powerful, and we can trust him with our lives. Every page of the Bible, I said this during our message series, points us to a sovereign God. From the very first words in the creation account in Genesis 
to the very last words, the words of Jesus' revelation at the end of the Bible. God is always in complete control. So our lesson learned is God is the God of the storm also. God is the God of the storm also. Uh, number seven, sometimes in the midst of our storms, we sin, right? Sometimes in the midst of our storms, we get so turned around, we get so shook up, we get so frustrated, angry, whatever it might be. Maybe we're just angry at our friends because they're miserable comforters, but whatever it is, we sin. In his suffering, Job overlooked the fact of, of who God is. He overlooked the facts that he knew that God is the creator of all that is, that, that God is the giver of all blessings, and, and that God is just, always just with his creation. I like how Job says this. Finally, in Job chapter 42, the second half of verse 3, he says, he says this to God, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. That was that moment when Job realized that all of his whys, all of his complaints, all of his confusion, that God was there. And then he follows a little bit later, a couple of verses later with this. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I despise myself and I repent. And so the lesson for us in, in this is that God will always accept a humble and repentant heart. We can yell and scream and, and as I like to say, jump up and down at God. That was my favorite thing as a kid. I didn't just yell and scream as a kid. I jumped up and down too. Maybe some of you did that. We can do that with God. And then we can come back to God when we've calmed ourselves and counted to 10 and humbly repent and God will accept and God will just wrap his arms back around us again. And that brings me to point number eight. After repentance and forgiveness comes blessing. At, at Job chapter 42 verse 8, God gives Job some instructions. He tells Job to offer a burnt offering for his friends and to, to pray for him. And then God accepts the, the prayer. Now think about this. How did Job feel about his friends? They were miserable comforters, right? But in the end, God kind of reprimands even the little guy, Bildad the shoe height. He reprimands them and says, you guys were lousy. But... My good man Job, he's going to offer a burnt offering. He's going to pray for you. Remember, Job did this for his children at the beginning of the story every single time they got together. And so look at what it says after that in verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Isn't that interesting? Think about this for a minute. Job forgave his friends because God asked him to. Job forgave his friends before he knew just how blessed he was about to be. He had no idea that God was going to do this for him. He simply blessed his friends and forgave them and prayed for them because God told him it was the right thing to do. And I think what's interesting is I believe that Job's prayers for his friends release those blessings. I believe that Job's prayers released those blessings. Needless to say, all of this, not just this part, but all of this was a life-changing event for Job. It was a life-changing experience. Through all that had hit him in that storm, truly Job stayed true to his faith. He never completely gave up on God. He wasn't sure. He was questioning, but... but even in his questioning, Job maintained his faith and his trust in God. And, and in the end, he came back to God and he repented of his words of confrontation towards God. And as we're about to read, Job's story had a happy ending. So I want to just read uh, chapter 42, beginning at verse 12. And I know that in our reading plan, you haven't gotten there yet, but the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. 
he had 14,000 sheep. Now, if you go back to the beginning, God doubled everything. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. Twice as much as he had before. And then verse 13 says, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. The good news for Job is God did not double the size of his family, however. Same number of kids. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then it goes on in verse 14, and it says, the first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Kareen Hapuk. Interesting names, but set aside their names because nowhere in the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father, I listen to this, their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. This was not normal in that culture at that time. We aren't, it doesn't explain why, but I have to believe that Job felt so blessed by God that he wanted to share that blessing with all of his children. He loved all of his children equally. And after this, it says Job lived 140 years. And he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. That would be a heck of a family reunion, wouldn't it? Wow. That would be incredible. And then it says, and so Job died an old man full of years. You know, when you and I have those times in life where we're, we're feeling a little stressed or we're feeling a little frustrated, where we have been, if you will, wounded by a storm. It's in those times more than ever when we need to stop. We need to stop and maybe take a deep breath and, and we need to step back and, and we need to look at the blessings around us. Because again, sometimes in the storm, the blessings get clouded. And, and so this is what Job finally realized. If he would just step back and see the blessings around him, and, and then we can remember how great God is, how good, good our Father is. In the tough times in life, in those storms in life especially, that's when we need to pick up the Bible. That's when we need to open up the Bible and begin reading. And I know that there are some in this congregation that their go-to story in the tough times is Job. They go to Job, but there's a lot of great. Just pick up the Bible and read. We need to, in those tough times when we're struggling, that's when we need to pay attention and learn more about why God loves us so much. We need to trust that if God can create this great universe, if God can cause rain to fall on Palm Sunday without us doing a thing, then he can also take care of us in the little storms of our life, if you will. In the tough times in life, we need to remember that God is the answer to our struggles in this world. God's answer to our suffering and struggles is his patience with our question and complaints. God's answering to our suffering and struggles is his compassion, even when we're a little harsh and critical of God. God's answer to our suffering and struggles is his mercy when we just want to set him straight because obviously we know better than God. God's answering to our, to our suffering and struggles is his understanding of all things. He says it well in Isaiah 55, 8, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. God's best and greatest answer to our suffering and struggles in this world is his restoration and blessing. Today's Palm Sunday. It's the day on the church calendar where um, if I would have been able to get them, I was a little late in thinking about it this year, we would have had palm branches to wave today and maybe, you know, sang a, a, you know, one of those good old Palm Sunday hymns. But on the table, I hope you'll take an opportunity. I shared those palms were the ones that I bought last year. And then the pandemic came. 
And I had a garage full of palms and nobody to give them to. And, and so my granddaughters, with their mother's help, made all those crosses for you to take and enjoy for part of your Holy Week worship. But today's Palm Sunday. It's that day when, on the church calendar, if you will, when we remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his entry into the last week of his life. And quite often we remember on that day how the people, not fully understanding the true wisdom and power and justice of the God that they believed in, not fully understanding those prophetic words that had been spoken centuries before, not fully understanding that what they needed was a Savior, stood along the road and shouted as Jesus rode in, Hosanna! Hosanna, save us, save us. Those people stood there that day hoping and wishing for a conquering king to come and run out the Roman rule to end their suffering and struggles in this world. But the good news for us is as believers in Jesus, we know how the story ends because we have the rest of the story. And, and so God's ultimate answer to our suffering and struggles in the storms of our life is really his gift of salvation in Jesus Christ for each and every one of us. This week, we are going to talk a lot about how Jesus came, how God came in the form of man named Jesus, and he lived and he died on a cross to open the way for you and I to have complete comfort and peace, even in our times of suffering. We're going to hear the story of how Jesus didn't stay in that grave. He rose from that grave not so that he could be really, really cool and we could sing songs and talk about it once a year, but he rose from that grave so that we could know that we too could have eternal life, a life free from pain and suffering and death. Jesus is the best and greatest answer to our struggles in this world. Jesus is that answer. I just want to leave you with these words. You can write this down, look them up a little later. Maybe, uh, maybe meditate on them a little bit this week coming up. Colossians 3, beginning at verse 1. Since, since you have been raised to new life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Friends, I wish I could end this series by telling you that there's never going to be another storm. I wish I could end this series by telling you it's all going to be perfect. But the truth is that storms are going to come. And all of our storms are not going to be the same. Some of our struggles are going to be much different than other people's struggles. But that's okay in the end. That's okay in the end because if we will in those struggles, no matter how big or how small, even in the joys of life, if we will just simply keep our focus on the things of God, if we will keep ourselves focused on the promises of God, and if we will trust God to ride out that storm with us, in the end, we're going to grow. In the end, we are going to gain salvation in Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is the good news that we are leading into with Holy Week. So let's come together and pray, shall we? God, I think it's pretty safe to say for all of us here, to, to admit for all of us here, that we don't always like the storms that you allow to happen around us. We don't always want to go through the storms in our life. But God, you are so good. And we do have to thank you today for loving us all the way through those storms. Even when we might be on our knees begging you to make them stop, pleading for it to end, you know what we need even in the storm. 
You know that we need you. We need your hope in that storm. And we need that so that we can grow closer to you, so that we can learn to fully trust you, so that we can truly understand our need for a Savior and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. God, will you help us maybe to receive that truth for the very first time today? If not, God, will you just help us to remember that truth today, that that truth is for our lives, that, that we can trust you in that truth and in that promise. God, may we this day and in the days ahead this week see you more fully in so many different ways around us. God, we pray for all of that and, and all the other things that we carry here with us today. We lift it all up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, thank you. It has been good to be with you this morning. You know, if I'm this fired up at the 9 o'clock service, it's going to be awesome at the 1030 service. So maybe you want to hang around, but um, just... I pray that you have found meaning in this sermon series. I pray that you found meaning in our worship here today. If you haven't already done so, please please be sure to fill out the connection card. There's some opportunities there to, uh, to connect with us in ministry. I uh, just want to remind you, if you haven't done so, an easy way to connect is uh, bring a bag of little candies that we can stuff in the Easter eggs for the kids next Sunday. And, and if you can't get them here today... You can bring them in during office hours if uh, during the week. If that doesn't work, call me on the phone. We'll figure out a way to make that happen. Um, we'd love for you to be part of that. Um, and then please uh, just drop these in the offering box with your offering on the way out. And, and thank you also for those generous donations that you are making to the ministry and mission of Crosswind. All that we do is done through your gifts. I do want to remind you that we have restarted Table Talk, and so we're meeting on Monday nights up at Five Lakes. Uh, we kind of begin the conversation at 7. Uh, some of us get there about 6.30, and we and have a little dinner. So if you want, you can come, have a little food, have a little drink. And, and each week I have some different interesting topics based off of what's been going on in our world. And we just sit and talk about where does life and faith intersect and love to have you be part of that conversation sometime good friday good friday's coming uh you know april 2nd this friday seven o'clock and i wrote this quote down because i always have to remind myself of this without the cross of good friday we can't fully experience the resurrection of easter sunday so i want to invite you to join me here uh, Friday night, Good Friday. It will be a brief service of music, and I'm going to be talking uh, Good Friday um, from the book of Luke this year. We're going to be talking about the man in the middle, this conversation that Jesus had with the two others hanging there with him. Um, Saturday is our men's first Saturday breakfast, so if you've got nothing going on at 7 o'clock, guys, we meet at AJ's Grill. Love to have you come, have a little food. Just Guys, food, conversation, just a good time to get together and enjoy that. And then Sunday, after the second service, Easter Sunday next week, we're going to have an Easter egg hunt out here, rain or shine, um, for the kids to have a good time. So we hope you'll come and be part of that. And one last thing I forgot to, uh, to put up on the screen. Um, oops, sorry, I knew I missed a slide. Don't, I don't want to go to the next song yet. Um, I want to uh, encourage you, if you're on Facebook, I'm not sure if it's going to hit YouTube or not, but I'm, my plan right now is to go live every morning this week about 8 o'clock with a Holy Week devotional. Um, I've had a great devotional that was sent to me, and um, it'll be just a brief time for us to kind of set our hearts every day of this Holy Week coming up between now and Easter, about 8 o'clock. So I hope you'll join me for that. I want to invite you now, if you will, to uh, stand.